Hello, you sexy little buggers. Look at you. We're live. We're live, John and Mark. Yeah. We wanted to do this for so long. Have we? And we're doing. Yes, you we have. Did. Have we? Yeah, we did. We did. We did. Uh, we're down here at Seven Brothers Brewing Company, which is it feels a, what a brewery. What a brewery. <laughs> what a, what a, what a selection of beers. Um, we've had. Uh, what have you had? They've had a little pills now. No, I, had, I, had, um, IPA. I had a watermelon wheat beer. You did. <laughs> you did. <laughs> yeah, because it's me. It's for, that, it's for you. It feels almost like we're on the set of Breaking Bad, doesn't it? As well, downstairs, like, it feels like people might have been sort of sliced up and bleached and put into these containers downstairs. But it's lovely. That would be a great. That would be a great beer, wouldn't and, it? And paint the picture, Wilco. Help me paint the picture in radio words. I mean, there's a, a couple. What? Just under a thousand people here, you'd say? Thousands. Probably. I can't see for the crowd. There's. Um, there's. Yeah. There's more tanks here. Mm. It's like 64-gallon tanks than there is people. Yeah, <laughs> lovely. Well, look, thank you so much for coming down to you, lovely lot. It's great to thank see you. Thank you very much. Um, you might have seen this sexy face at the front here as well. We've got to introduce him because he's not. otherwise he's going to sit there and we're going to talk. Not me. JJB's in the house, everybody. Put your hands together for JJB. Good evening, good evening. Good to have you, mate. Great to see you. Um, look, and of course, we're building up to the, the grand final, which is on Saturday. We've got the trophy here. You boys have all had your filthy hands on that before. Is that the real one, John, do you think? Or is it, is it like the Premier League? Have they got about 15 of them? I don't know. It looks real, doesn't it? That's all it that That's, you know, that's the most <laughs> important you. thing, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. Do you know what I mean? What, do you want me to touch it? I don't think we're allowed to. <laughs> um, Ollie, no, over there is getting panicking about that already. Um, what's this week like, JJB? Come on, look, you've done it so many. I mean, you, uh, what, first, what do you do with all those rings? Eight rings. Mark, we'll talk about yours. You've got yours burgled, Just didn't you? Just the one. Were you yeah. stolen? I can't believe you had eight. That's unbelievable. Yeah, I've got one for each finger now. Two for each kid. Um, <laughs> It was good. No, it was really good. That's why I had to retire and there no more fingers left to uh, <laughs> occupy. Are they Not, really shit cheap rings like from Argos? Or they no, actually... no, they're actually pretty good. I, somebody asked me to send them a photograph, actually, and a mate, a fan of mine, um, not mine, of, of Lee Drynals. Uh, and I got them all out and put them side by side, and they've actually increased slightly the density of them each year. They've got a little <laughs> bit better. I've got all four on now, actually. The, all four is my first one. And it was the first time I ever saw Leeds won a championship. In fact, it was the first time Leeds won a championship in my lifetime. Yeah. So to be on a pitch at the time, off the bench, was really special for me. Uh, but it's a great week. It's a special occasion. You guys will testify to it because it's the pinnacle, and it? It's the grand final. It's the last week of the year. What was really interesting, some of the success I had with my cohort of players, if you like, at Rhinos, was most of the success come from the grand final. It's always the last game of the year. You win it, and that's it. Down tools, and you go on holiday and all the rest of it. And it's three or four months before you're back playing. Uh, when you contrasted that with the Challenge Cup, for example, which is another great trophy to win, it was really interesting that the first time we actually won the Challenge Cup, having lost three in a row in 10, 11, 12, mm. first time we, we, we won it, it was like we got beat every single game. After that, we like <laughs> died a death. And it was almost like this expectation of down tools, we've done it all and that's end of journey. Mm. And it was a big sort of refining, uh, refining process, lesson to learn, but... Yeah, the grand final for me was always my favourite. It's a bit like a high school smash and grab because Old Trafford, there's no, we're talking about it early, won't we? You don't train on that day before. As soon as you've, the final whistle has gone, you can do your parade and they tell you, get off at pitch now, get off. Mm. It's Old Trafford, this, you're going to mess grass up. Um, <laughs> and you get off there, but it's, yeah, it's a special occasion. I, lo I love that Jones is what he's painting a picture of. It's the final day of the season and this beautiful euphoria that lasts for like months after because you've won your last game. Yep. Let me tell you, Jonesy, that's not always how it happens, is it? <laughs> no. So, so Jamie Jones Buchanan, he's got his suitcase, speedos, you know, he's, he's going on holiday. Mm. He bounces into Manchester Airport. Everything's good. Just won the grand final. He's going to Cancun. Benidorm. Cuba. Cuba. He's going to that exactly. That's more you, he's isn't it? He's going to Cuba. Cuba. Once, mate. He's going to an obscure good. country in South America. That's all you need to know. <laughs> that you've never thought of going and Jones is going. That fits. Um, but he bounces through that airport. Mm. There's been many times I've not bounced anywhere. You know, for you know, you're checking in. You've got your suitcase. You just feel, oh, you feel pathetic. Will yeah. you know? You look at yourself. You think you're a loser. You know, yeah. you're checking in. You know, I'm going to. I am going to Malaga. You know what I mean? <laughs> if if I'd have won, I'd have been going to Peru. <laughs> No, just as a filing. Yeah, I, I Dublin. I was doing three nights in Dublin. Will Sinking that's what? Your yeah, five five years on the spin. Three nights in Dublin with the wife. She's uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway. While Jonesy was all inclusive. So anyway, that last day defines your year. Mm. And and you know Jonesy's talks about the acute sort of joy of winning and downing tools and walking off. Well, the flip to that is somebody this weekend will down tools and just feel a bit. Yeah. 
like let down by the season, you know, and that's that's the brutality of sport. Actually, that's what I love about sport. It's the opposites, isn't it? That's the, not the, like you to look at the negative aspects of a, a romantic well, it's not, it's not situation. the negative aspects. I'm just listening mm. to Jonesy talk really like romantically Get on and you're about, bringing him back. And down. I just thought the amount of times this fuck has put me through the mill. Well, look, I want to ask you about <laughs> that because, and I know, but you've we've talked about this loads before, but it's almost like that St Helens period from '07 to '11. <laughs> which is basically what you're summing up those those airport trips yeah. F- five back to back yeah yeah i mean it's kind of unheard of isn't it yeah. three of them at the hands of you it is unheard of will yeah it's not kind what of a, it's, not kind, it's not kind of it's not kind of unheard of is it <laughs> it's mean, just that, unheard what, of what what the hell you know when after after the second after the third what the hell goes what, through you your mind well, have, you, have you ever have you yeah. ever watched a car what were you doing losing have you ever watched a car crash repeatedly and then still go back it's like stood on the M6 looking down over the Nutsford Junction and just watching a crash happen and going back the next day and it happens again. <laughs> and by the end of it, you know, it feels fine. You're like, oh, it's another, it's another car crash. That's fine. <laughs> and then by the end of it, you just get used to it. You're getting this, this, this mental sort mm. of thing where, yeah, that's what I deserve. <laughs> did, you, did, you, did even you feel sorry for them a bit, JJB? After not, not at all, mate. No, no yeah, you, you've, you've got you've got to go there. Win, it's an interesting one, though, John. Yes, you no know, positive affirmations. I suppose maybe negative ones as well. You know, for I know sure, you're in, yeah. in psychology, but in that approach, have you always got last year on your mind? And oh no, not not mm. three in a row, two in a row. Yeah. And again, I think we won in in 2011. I don't know if you was. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, 2011. So it was, it was four, innit? And, and not to rub it in. And yeah. put, but, uh, no, 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 you are. Well, yeah. not to rub it in. <laughs> That's, exactly That's like saying no disrespect when you speak to somebody, isn't it? You know, you do mean maximum disrespect. Now, yeah, I think the, the negative, like, I think when you are in that situation where you're winning, um, the positive is easy to deal with, isn't it? Because it sort of feeds itself. I think negativity really fascinates me because you spend an awful lot of time in life denying negativity. I feel like when you're asked about it, you have to deny it. It's not a thing. Are you thinking about the fact you've lost the last two or three? And what can you say? It's a shit fucking modern journalistic question that where there is only one way to answer it, which annoys me. I, I just think a journalist saying, well, oh, is it, you know, you've lost three in a row. You're going to be thinking about that. Can you imagine if I'd have said, yeah, do you know what? Yes. It could, that could yeah. easily be the reason we don't win again, yeah. which is the truth, but you'd never say it, But that negativity you? is almost contagious then when it's happening back to back to back to back. Yeah, I, I just think um, momentum, confidence are the most elusive things in sport. And people don't understand where momentum and confidence come from and go to, but I guarantee you this, they are the two most crucial ingredients in sport. And if you, you know, you win, or you lose momentum and confidence, I believe are the two of the biggest things because you talk about the core competencies of the lead side or the teams that beat us through that period. Um, There's very little in it, you know, absolutely marginal difference between us. The difference was momentum and confidence. And I think, uh, you know, we're going into grand final week. The, the, the team that approaches it where they're not scared, but they're confident and they attack it will win and, and, and you know, that's you know, maybe my take on it. But. I think it was quite seasonal as well, you know, time of year when yeah. it started getting a bit dewy, a bit wet on the morning and you could smell, smell grass because we'd get paggered a lot of time going to North of the Road or playing against Saints during the season. You know, you'd go there knowing it's going to be a really tough, fast game. You're going to have to start well. And you'd be eight minutes in and you'd be 18 nil down and sing hallelujah under sticks. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's not again. But for some reason, we used to be able to turn it round in, in the sort of grand final, the playoff period. Yeah. Cass beat us 66-10 in, in 2017. Mm. And I remember Brian Mack saying, oh, we weren't far off. I think we could win a conference. <laughs> like, is he mad? Is he, and we won he it. Mad. You know? yeah. Yeah, he's is, mad. Is that oh, psychology yeah. from the head coach, though? Is he one step ahead of you thinking, I don't want these blokes to be peaking at the early start of the season <clears throat> and know that the winning is at the end? Because some coaches will put everything into the start of the season and then you, you blow teams away and then you kind of blow out of steam by, you know, m- mid-summer time. Brian Mack was pretty good at that, wasn't he? Peaking the teams at the right right, right time. Yeah. It, it, he'd always say, you're not ready yet. You're not ready to beat Saints. You're not ready to beat Wigan. But we will be by the time we need to. It's a little bit like 400 metre race, isn't it? I know that it's, it is the person that runs the fastest who wins. But actually, you define that by who slows down the least in the last 100. Because that's where fatigue gets them all, isn't it? Sometimes you only have to be six, seven out of ten during the season. But when it comes to playoffs, 
you only have to be, we've won it from fifth twice, well we did do, won it from fifth twice, you only have to be good for that, that two, three week period and, and be exceptional. You know, out of that, that dynasty, we only think we only finished top maybe three times yeah, in, yeah. in a 15 year sort of period, you know, so yeah. wasn't so much consistent either. But this year, got Catalan who are immensely consistent and methodical process driven well coached yeah. team and I think it's going to be really interesting watching them against who are probably the standard as far as where you want to be from a performance point of view in St. Yeah. Helens. Yeah, have, we, have we got any Saints fans in the house tonight? Yeah, a couple of you. Who remembers Mark Flanagan playing half back in the I grand do. final 2014? Oh, He's never, he doesn't does. mention it much, but <laughs> and look, now That's you can probably him, understand yeah. why Wilco's is even more complex the more you get to know him, whenever, because obviously he missed that night and he kind of, you know, off the back of those five straight defeats, that was the next grand final you got to, yeah. wasn't it? 2014, yeah, you missed yeah, that yeah. one. And then obviously now they're winning potentially three back to back and you're not there so um. <laughs> <laughs> again you stood on the Nutsford flyover watching a car crash happen but, and look how happy you are about I, know, it. I, know, I, know, I, know. I shouldn't be happy at your misfortune sometimes it's nice um, look Mark that was a massive week for you I mean look for a southern fairy like me that was actually that was the first grand final I went to that 2014 just under the lights it's, there's something really special about it even as a city fan to go to that shithole is, there's something really special about that place yeah a few United fans in here, by the noise of that, a few sounds. Um, look, come on, that was an amazing, amazing time. Yeah, for you. Was, I know, I know you were, they yeah. were a man light, and it was just, it was it had such a different dynamic to the game, didn't it? Particularly in that second half when you were hanging on. And yeah, I, th I think you know all rugby league players. The first grand final they play at is pretty special because you never, you'll never experience that walking out of Old Trafford, full crowd, and that atmosphere, the anticipation, just, just the occasion of it. Um, mm. And for me, it was pretty special because I used to go with my family to watch as a kid, and I was dreamt, always dreamt of, of being there. So, um, I think it's it's a game where you've got to stick to the process. You've got to just be methodical, like John said that that Catalan have been all year. Um, and it's just it's a game where the, the, all the little one percenters matter. You kind of before the match, you, you'll kind of dream about ch chipping over the top, regathering, little flick pass, someone will score, you'll be the man. But mm. it very rarely happens like that. So from my experience, and when we won in 14, we won by grinding out a victory, just doing all the boring, tough stuff. And that got us home. And I think whoever wins on Saturday will do the same thing. There might be a few big players in there, but what will win the match is the boring stuff, which... Mm kind of arouses me a little bit I like it the, th the, the most valuable part about a grand final and as a player that you take from it are the things that people don't get to see so everybody who goes to watch a grand final um, you know watches the game unfold but it's not that that I found special about the grand final or big games it's the smallest of details like Old Trafford the tunnel drops down about 10 metres so you can't see the pitch. So you're in the tunnel. So you come out of the dressing rooms and it's this unbelievable, and you can see the atmosphere sort of building outside, but you drop down this this sort of angled tunnel, Jonesy, right? And and you can't see the pitch. And, and there's something mesmeric in sport about the moment at which you see the pitch. So as a, an, an eight year old, I, w I went to Wembley um, to watch a Challenge Cup final. And that moment where I popped up and then could see the pitch, there's something in that in sport. It's like an unbelievable moment and the smelling of the grass that's just been cut or, but in Old Trafford, there's the, there's this suspense where you can't see the pitch. You can't see the crowd and the atmosphere and you drop it, down the tunnel and you come out and you come up the, the you know, the, the cambered sort of surface onto the pitch, which, you know, on TV looks like nothing. It looks like you just walk down and come back out. It's not, it's, it feels In it's one of the opening scenes special. of Gladiator, he, when he about half an hour in, he goes, he kind of gets extradited from the the army, and he goes, he goes and battles for the first time. And there's a scene where all the the guys who are ready to battle are waiting to go out, out in this amphitheater, and they can't see where they're going, but they could hear the noise and the suspense and the atmosphere and the the the, the feeling amongst the guys is, is pretty tangible. They're all so nervous, and that's what I like in that too. That you can't see where you're going, but you can feel it. There's a there's something in the air and and it's it's an unbelievable feeling, and you kind of you, you're willing to go to war, you're willing to put your body on the line to to, to do whatever, and that's that's 
proper living that. Mm. I loved it. There's they a scene do... in that Gladiator film as well. When you said that, there's a guy peeing himself. Is that scared? Is, that's, it, that's the same one. He it, it's like... <laughs> yeah. and it's funny. That was me, actually, in yeah, 14. Yeah. No, I think that was me. It's it's fu- a bit yeah, just a little bit came out. Yeah. But I, I, I think I'd played it probably in my fifth or sixth grand final. I remember being at Genuine and thinking, what am I doing here? Like this panic, anxiety, this big game, started to doubt myself and mm. thinking, I don't know, if it had been like Truman Show, I could have exited through a door, probably would have done. I'm like, oh, texting my missus. And ultimately, though, it comes down to that trust in it, that in, yeah. in your teammates, that you've all prepared really well, and every experience you ever go through in life gets you to that particular moment in time. But yeah. you never sort of become accustomed to it, I don't think. And what John's describing, walking down that 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 tunnel, never, no, the novelty never wears off, and it never becomes ordinary. I'm interested that I mean, I'm sure you boys are as well in that that winning machine, which we've talked about so much on this yeah. podcast, and like that slick, well-oiled leads team that you were part of that golden generation with um, and it's amazing really. well, is it amazing really to think all the way back to 1998 that only Leeds, Bradford, Saints and Wigan have, have won it they're the only four teams that have ever won the grand final you know Warrington have had a crack Catalan first time that they're going to be in the final yeah. but when you you know you, Leeds have won it eight times and you've got those eight rings because you played up until whatever you were 39 when, when you finished but what was it, if you try and describe that that well-oiled machine that I was talking about. Yeah. What What did that look like when you try and when you try and describe it to be part of? I've talked a lot about it because it's still there. It's transcendent, and I think I always, I always talk about that. This this forging of this love, this this generation of players that came through from uh, this cohort of from being about fifteen. Um, and to be honest with you, look, we, we come through about 99, 2000, it was 2004 before we won up, went through a lot of adversity. And you know, a lot of people don't talk about the fact we become first team to win three in a row, seven, eight, nine, and then first team to lose three Challenge Cups in a row in 10, 11, 12. So it was very much contrasted, the success and the failure. Treat those two imposters just the same, though, like Rudyard Kipling. We had a bit of both, but what we did was learn from every experience, persevered through it. We saw each other at our biggest, our strongest, and also at our weakest when, when we struggled. Uh, and we just forged this this transcendent relationship that we caught spirit at Rhino, I suppose, now, that we still see in the likes of the acts of Kevin Sinfield doing his 77 for Rob Burrow. You know, that, that relationship we've still got with the key seniors, the Jamie Peacocks, Danny Maguires, uh, and some of these events that are, are still really tangible and you still get the essence of who and what that generation was all about. But it was, it was without doubt born out of adversity for me and perseverance. And I think that's why it's no coincidence that the most successful teams that you've just mentioned there uh, are usually the ones that have had a, a core nucleus of, of lads come through together and, and witness and see the, each other in, in, the, in the good and bad lights. Yeah, you um, had that sense, and, didn't you, as well? Yeah, no, we, we were really different to that. Like, no, I don't, I don't think we had that. But you had a nucleus, didn't you? We had a nucleus, but the nucleus was, like, well fractured. It wasn't, it wasn't like... What, what Jones is describing here is a group of young guys who came through a development system and then developed into a senior team and then through experiences bonded and became really close. Now, you know, I, t- I take so much time and to think back to the time where we had the best players, the Saints, we had the best players. Yeah. We had the best team, you know, in many senses. We had the best individual parts. Um, but that was thrown together. It wasn't like this sort of youthful energy that had grown and developed and understood robustness and resilience together. We had the best players. Mm. So so Saints had Paul Sculthorpe, who they signed from Warrington, Sean Long, who they signed from Widness. We had, um, looking back, actually, really conflict-driven environment where there was like a, almost like a power struggle for who was in charge of the team all the time. It wasn't like harmonious. Like, if you walked into the Saints dressing room maybe 2002 to 10, maybe 2002 to eight, it was like ferocious. It wasn't like um, what Jones is describing there. It was really- Was it conflicting opinions and people? Yeah, it was just, there was- There was- was, More um, chiefs than Indians. Yeah, just, I thought we had a stark, you know, we we, we interviewed um, a fantastic psychologist, Damien Hughes, didn't we? And he mentioned something and it, it was when he was talking about different cultures and he mentioned a culture he said oh there's different types of cultures there's a star culture where you've got the best sort of components all put together and there's an assumption that works well at saints i i actually believe we we had that for a period and um 
when that had, when that had gone, what we tried to do as a club is replicate the success of a team that was just a group of stars. But there was no culture once that had gone. It didn't exist. There was nothing there. So we spent maybe ten years trying to like build that back and and do you know what the biggest achievement of not not my career but the cl I think the club during that time was I think the lowest we finished in the league was fourth even though we had no substance to build on mm. do you know and, and so this is a lot of that though doesn't it yeah it does and and I think about Leeds and I think about what was remarkable about Leeds is Leeds could be shit for ages and you know I'd watch them on telly and think oh Right, <laughs> these guys are getting it. You know what I mean when we play them, and and they could be bad. They get smashed. You'd be fifth in the table, but they had a knack of getting it over the line. Well, timing's everything in life, will. Yeah, isn't it? Mm. You know, that's amazing, we're, though, isn't it? That like, knack. When, ma where does that come timing. from? Where does it, because that that's, that's, that's that must the nail come from the, the head, coach, isn't it? Though. Being able to, or is that just that can be coincidence, or is it a mentality that you all knew that the games during the season didn't matter until you got to the back end? Or is there a puppeteer at the top, namely Brian McDermott, who was kind of manipulating game plans or team selection or different kind of motivational factors to kind of know that you don't need it now. You don't need to be playing well now. You don't it's need to risky, be playing well now. It is risky. In those but but, but in, a, in a Super League season, it takes so much toll on the body to, to, to perform week in, week out, mm. that it might be smart that to think that you know, you don't need to be playing well now. You don't need to be playing well. And then back two months of the season, hit form, fucking win the... Mm. Sorry, for swearing. Yeah, yeah Ooh, that's the whole oh, word on the podcast. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> the sea sorry. Paris Hilton here. Well, bleep we that might have to bleep that one. Sorry, everybody. That Mark. Sorry, Mum. Gets excited. Go on, JJB. No, I want to reflect on some of that, and I think a lot about it. Um, I think it was probably more Kevin Sinfield than it was a coach. And you know, Kev's whiter than white, isn't he? He's like the, the, the cowboy that rides into the into the Wild West <laughs> covered in white and the white horse. And uh, he run quite a tight ship, had massively high expectations, was immaculate in everything that he did. Mm. And to be able to do that, actually, we, day in, day out, like for a full season, it's, it's hard. It's emotionally and physically draining to sort of be at the top echelons. I don't know how possible that is. And maybe that's why you guys were a little bit different, you know. When you, I'm not saying you you were looser, but probably didn't have that intenseness about being perfect all the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we when were, it, we were, were loose, we, yeah. Well, when, and we weren't, we weren't. You know, I, know, I remember I know. Brian McDermott coming in and saying it's like a boys' club, this. Yeah. And you know, Kev was really pedantic about anybody who, and I won't name any names, but anybody who didn't live to them standards just. Just cut It'd be them loose. better if you name names, yeah. though, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. Do you know you what I mean? You probably guess, mate. You could probably, guess, mate. You could probably guess. Yeah. Um, Give us a couple of names. Come on. But, um, no, come back end of the season, that just, you know, it, 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 the, the Nexus, everybody just came together, said, right, for this period, we're going to have to be the best versions of ourselves. Yeah. And just raise that bar. I was described like meerkats when they, they sit up like that and start looking around when uh, the, the the grass starts mm. getting a bit wet in the morning yeah. and it changes. But Brian, Brian McDermott. What, so I played under Brian at Toronto and I, I saw. I think I've said this on the podcast before. I realised not why Leeds beat us or, or why Leeds was successful, but I just saw a glimpse of how that was possible. You know, like what what made it mm. possible. What activated when you it. You. Yeah. So we were playing in a grand final in the championship and he, he just got pulled me to one side and he said, look, we're two weeks out. We're going to be in the grand final in two weeks. Um, he said, um, there's a load of bullshit where we've got to do this, like, you know, your family sent you a message and, you know, we're abroad and everybody wants the, you know, the wife and the kids to do this big emotional video wishing as well and that. And he's like, like I just want to get it out of the way now. Like, 14 days out. You know, that's the kind of thing at Saints. We'd be sat in a darkened room mm. watching Rocky IV the night before <laughs> the grand final. Do you know what I mean? It's not the best no, Rocky. No, but what, what, Rocky V or whatever. We're sat in a dark room <laughs> watching Rocky or watching, you Rocky know, any, any given one. Sunday. You know, watching Al Pacino deliver this speech. <laughs> and you're like, ah, oh, whereas... Brian McDermott just got all the emotional bollocks out of the way. He just was like, right, let's deal with this now. It's done, and then we can just get on to prepare. And I thought, smart that. And, and I just thought, if he's thinking like that, he thinks deeply about performance, and he thinks deeply about the pollution, the things that pollute performance. And there's loads of, you know, there's a million things that pollute your performance, but he was acutely aware of 
what was important to eliminate at that point for me. And and it just made me go, wow, you know, like that's something we, we got wrong. I think it's something sports people get wrong, you know, in general is, is, is leave the emotional bit right to the end and go, right, just before we do something, let's get really emotionally aroused. When sport is rarely played its best when you are hyper emotional you know you need depends to depends on the person though doesn't it some people respond to that and well, some like, people like, go the other like way ben, ben flower yeah well that's an example yeah <laughs> lod yeah. last 10 minutes is it 10 well, minutes well two, is it two yeah. minutes? But, but some people <laughs> respond to those emotional cues and some people go the other way it's, nah, it's, it's a fight yeah. or flight mentality yeah I think but i think ways. if you're not emotionally aroused walking down the tunnel exactly. at old trafford then there's a misunderstanding of what you are there for mm. it, it's could you like, play with that could you play on the edge with that emotion well, yeah, you, I'm would, quite would, an emotional person. I'm a, I'm a people person. So I, I do get that motivational side of stuff and I, I, I don't mind it, but some don't. And you're right, Tony Smith was very similar as a coach. It'd be like, look, we're playing the grand final. It's no different to what we want you to do on Boxing Day. Just do all technical things really well. Just do what we've trained and practised and prepared for and we'll get the win. Everybody just do your job. You said it right at the start. You know, we, we dream about chip over the top and, and big u boot players, but actually works, what, you, what you want is just everybody to do the job really well. Uh, mm. and, and you'll get the result. Um, Brian McLennan was a little bit different. He was always about the narrative, the story, why we're here, why we're doing this. And, and Brian Mack was somewhere in between, but he, he could really see about what was important. Uh, Brian Mack. But just, sorry, on the other side of it, Kev, for example, is probably my closest mate. Yeah. Uh, from a personality trait point of view, he's the complete opposite. Yeah. Mad OCD, task oriented. Um, very introvert. I was a really extrovert. So we sort of we covered all, all sort of bases. Um, but you know, Kev, he wasn't emotional at all, was he? He's not, he's not the that sort of guy. But the mix, the mix of the team, I think, just brings and covers every every yeah. base if you've got that good mix. One of the best grand final stories for me, in terms of again from the outside, was Salford getting to the final. Do you remember John said we'd never get there, about <laughs> yeah, I do remember felt. that. It's funny that wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> wasn't there? You'd have to get a tattoo or something. Of well, it's, your it's fine getting there, isn't it? They didn't, they didn't win it. Did they? Yeah, no, but you, do you know said, what I mean? I never said we it's like going to like celebrate <laughs> nearly doing well. <laughs> no, you said we wouldn't get there. Nobody ever. I was just, just going like, to be nice to right. Mark for five minutes. I know, I know, but this, I'll give you a story about you this. You haven't been there in a while, John, the B, so don't the B, worry about it. I know, the BB, <laughs> Mark, come on, you've won it. It's fine. It's fine. In, in, 20, um, in the Challenge Cup last year, the BBC, we were covering a game and they'd wrote, written this story about uh, Tom Johnston being the big story. Yeah. And they'd pitched it to me in the truck before you go on telly about Tom Johnston. We're going to talk about Tom Johnston, which fucks me off anyway, because I think, why would you already go into a game with a preconceived idea about what you're going to talk about, yeah. which is mental? Anyway, the producer came into me here and goes, well, we've got some Tom Johnston nearly scoring tries. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what are we doing here? We're showing people nearly scoring tries. <laughs> it's like, you know, nearly, nearly, winning, winning, the, the nearly winning the grand final. <laughs> you were in the game. You were in the game. No, for it was a, yeah, good, yeah, it was a massive achievement. That, yeah, I, know, I know I'm not I'm taking how, the piss. How it was, was massive. that from the Saints experience? Albeit, what was that, six years before 2014? I mean, because let's face it, Salford, you'd, you'd been shit. You'd rebuilt this team. You'd got this camaraderie, you know, Jackson, a little bit, not everyone liked him, but he was working for that team. You had the, the coaching dynamic with Ian Watson. Everything came together at the right time. And this is off the back of, you know, what, what, a year later, you then get to a Challenge Cup final. And yeah. What was what was know, going I, on at that club? I was club? thinking about this the last couple of weeks, and I see a lot of parallels between Solfer going to the Grand Final, having the success in 19, um, and a few years early, earlier in 16, being in a million pound game and being mm. so far from relegation to Catalans this last couple of years they got they won the Challenge Cup a few years ago and they're in the grand final obviously yeah. this week um, but previous to that they were in the similar situation they, they, they could yeah. have gone down and it made me think that sometimes when you're so close to the abyss you're so close to you know we were close to extinction, extinction in 16 and Catalan would have, could have gone down had they lost to, to Lee in that match and I think when you're so close to devastation it makes you take stock and realise where you are and you have a holistic view on on how to improve and I think that that's a really good recipe to kind of for progression because you look at the, the organisation as a whole you look at the, the junior academy your recruitment your squad in general because you need to really change things up and I, and I think that's what they've done these last few years because a lot of clubs who are probably maybe mid-table mid-lower table don't have that kind of that, that view they probably think oh we need to tweak this tweak that we'll improve but if you're in that position, you need to change a whole lot of stuff to get better. And Catalan have certainly done that 
since they came into the competition many years ago, they've been on a journey and I think off the field they've got better. I, I was really impressed to see the, the semi-final against KR and, and the atmosphere and the crowd there was unbelievable. They've recruited really well these last couple of years uh, and I think they're a massive threat. But coming back to Salford, I think what we had, and I, I touched on something Jonesy said in terms of you know, they had a group of players that had, had come through together. Now, now we had not a group of players that had come through at Salford together, but we all arrived at the same time. We were on a, 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 of a similar mindset of we wanted to win, we wanted to prove people wrong. And there were people, a lot, a lot of you there who were told yeah, we no were, yeah. by big clubs. And they yeah, were... We, were, we were termed the misfits. So yeah. we were unwanted by lots of different clubs. And we, we all came together for a common goal of proving people wrong. And whether that was myself, you know, I wanted to stay at Saints. I wasn't wanted. Liam Mossop had lots of injuries. We were co-captain. So we could probably drove those those habits and that kind of, um, that 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 fact to prove people wrong. And we had a lot of people who, who were on on board with that. And, you know, when you've got a collective of people who are, who are striving together, you can you can do pretty good things. That's that's what Mark's described and, and Jonesy described it as well. Is is appetite and hunger, mm. and and like, you know, you you guys had it through maybe, um, you know, different career paths and getting to a point, and and then also feeling like people didn't take you credibly. You know, like I we joked about Salford's credibility. You know, but that's, you know subconsciously that makes you hungry to prove that wrong you know Jonesy finishing fifth in the league when it just won the grand final the year before it leaves space for appetite to be there and you know I, I think you know I respect people who do it when they shouldn't and they're hungry to do it do you know the people who blow my fucking mind are the people who do it all the fucking time Cristiano Ronaldo, like, you know, these people, like once in a lifetime people who are the best and just do it, even though there's no, there's no, they have got hunger, you know, you'd have to get really deep inside their psychology to understand why they're hungry and why they maintain that hunger. But in team sports, like appetite and wanting and needing to do better is really powerful. In the NBA, they did a study at half time in games. I think I've, I've, said this on the podcast again before is at half time in games the most likely team to win were not the team that are winning it's the team that's just behind so it, over 3,000 games they studied 3,000 games which is you know a largish sample of, it's of, a lot of games, games. Isn't it? yeah and that's you know if you're winning by miles you likely win but when you get that out of the way the team that's most likely to win is the team that's just behind at half time and I find that like really interesting because it doesn't make sense does it it's not sensible like you would say well the team's winning at half time most likely win but overwhelmingly the team just behind at half time goes on to win a game and I think that speaks to the what we're talking about is having hunger appetite to be better drive to be better and you know there's certain people in life who, who, who have that but we don't see it it's remarkable, but there's teams that have used it, and I think Salford used it for sure. And I think Leeds, you know, they they used it, whether by design or not. I don't think it can sometimes be by design, but it's certainly a really powerful tool in sport. I think it's a narrative that you've got to create to thread through the team and have a story. And if you've got a common story and a common goal, the, the game plans become relevant as long as everybody understands the role. It's fine, but when you've got a story and you all understand it, that, that's what I think drives you. I, I don't know, it is counterintuitive, isn't it, to think that the team who's just behind, maybe they're just thinking, well, how good would it be if we went on to win this? And that in itself is just enough, because joy or sadness always sits in the gap between expectation and reality. And I suppose if the team that's just in front has got a slightly smaller expectation of not, or not being beat, you know, so that the narrative is better for the team uh, that's behind. I, I was. I, I had a really good story. You, you like this, John? I'll give you this, this book. Uh, this this hotel owner. It was all about the the people within teams or within groups. You're either a gazelle, a cheetah, or a lion. 
and it says all three of them get up every morning and run really fast because Elf's got to run fast otherwise it gets caught and eaten. Cheetah runs really fast because it's got to catch his gazelle to get its food. The lions run really fast because they've got to catch the gazelle as well. And if they don't, the cheetah and the, the lion, they don't run fast, they don't catch the prey, they don't get any food, they die. The difference is that the cheetah runs really fast on its own and it's got to catch its prey and it's got to eat it quick otherwise lions will take it off it. So it's quite selfish. Right? Um, and the lions, though, they'll go out and they'll work together as a pride. And whilst they sleep for 18 hours a day and the, they're not as quick, they actually do it in a team. But when the lion eats, it shares its food. So even if you have a bad day, everybody gets fed. The day that the cheetah has the, the bad day, it's going to die. You know, so everybody within a group, within a team, is either a cheetah, a lion, or a gazelle. Sometimes it's really hard because everybody's running fast. Everybody's trying the nuts off out there. But what you find or what you want in my personal experience and in opinion is want a team for the Lions or it's what I experienced in my group. We're quite altruistic, benevolent, selfless uh, and looked after each other. Certainly at those times when we most needed to do it. But people like Ronaldo, you think to yourself, is there a space for a cheater? Well, you get these, these people who maybe even might be self-deluded, tell themselves lies every day that I'm not good and believe it. You know, I once read somewhere that self-deception is an absolute must for evolution. Because if you if you believe and understood, believes is an evolution yeah, of man. Yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah. <laughs> but but, but, but we're saying he any, does, any, he does, doesn't Will does, thinks yeah. that as well, you know. <laughs> any culture that that understood the totality of reality wouldn't thrive. It was saying so. You've got to self delude yourself about who and what you are, your own self image. Um, so, so yeah, I think I think it's all about the story, the storytelling. Love that. I mean, look, you do an hour on that as a podcast, can you? That's fascinating. Um, look, I want to do a few more minutes with you and give you guys an opportunity to go and get another pint. Um, and then we've got another special guest for you. You might see this handsome man at the front. No spoilers yet. Um, look, you mentioned Rob Burrow earlier and you mentioned Kevin Sinfield. And you mentioned Kevin Sinfield being quite emotionless, whatever, at least on the exterior. And I think we've seen a different side to him, haven't we, over the last 12 months with the marathons he's been doing, everything he's been doing for Rob. Allow yourself just for a few minutes to get a little bit emotional because someone that you've been through all these experiences with and you've lifted this trophy with so many times, to see Rob going through what he's going through and going through it in a blaze of glory, the things he's doing is just so inspiring i've just bought his book started reading it it's sensational we've had him on the podcast i mean it may you guys know him far better than i do but it, may, it makes me sad to think even when we had him on the podcast what i think we're talking january last year just yeah. before covid yeah, yeah, just yeah. before covid before he COVID. came down he drove down he was going to stick around for a pint we had a good chat you know his voice was starting to go a bit but just the speed in which he's deteriorated is it's heartbreaking it's heartbreaking it's a it's, a, it's, it's just the most cretinous illness and disease you could ever imagine but for someone so close to him how do, how how do you process that and i guess when you see him you've you, you've got to be strong you can't break down you can't be sad in front of him because he doesn't want any of that shit does he no no absolutely you've got to remember that it's been a difficult process for me from a, an emotional point of view you mentioned his book when i read his book i can hear his voice i've always been a picture person so i've talked about being extrovert and uh, uh, um a people person. So if I was, say, going to go do a speech, I couldn't write down bullet points. I'd have to write, take pictures with me. When I see a picture, then I, you know, I see it in my mind. And so when I'm reading his book, I can see and hear Rob speaking. And when I go see him now, even though he's deteriorated, as you say, physically, behind the eyes, I still see exactly the same Rob. And I spent that much time with him. I could almost understand all the nuances of what he'd say, how he'd say it in that, that amazing wit that Rob always had and that we miss. And it is difficult having a conversation with him because you, 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 that's what you waited for with Rob. That was the gold behind him. But I've been with him and a part of him for that long. You still feel essence. And I, I was with him on his birthday last Sundays, uh, last two Sundays ago. Um, Kev recently won the, the Spirit of Super League and, and uh, we filmed the video with, with Rob. And you know, I just sat and talked to him like I would. And, and his expression still smiles, still nods. Uh, and you know, despite the fact he's, he has deteriorated in, in the way that he has, you still feel like there's a, there's a conversation there, but it, it's difficult. And I think emotionally, why it's been so hard for me is because I, I really struggle with this inevitability about motor neuron disease. As a sports person, we're always wanting to bash through a boundary, say, no, it, this is possible, we can, we can heal this. And whilst we can't medically, because we're not medically trained, what we can do is, is the challenges and uh, the fundraising to raise awareness and money for the people that can, that are trained to do it. Uh, and whilst we've still got the power in our legs to do that, that's exactly what we need to do and we'll continue to do. Um, just almost be stubborn at the fact that, you know, this disease at the minute, at the minute, 
is is not is not curable. But I, I absolutely believe you know one day um, it, it will be if people keep pushing hard enough. I think there's something really interesting happened as well in society is that now when people are ill. We talk about them fighting things. You know, they're putting up a fight. They're going to fight, and and uh, you know, I agree. There's 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 no like acceptance that the, your mortality is facing you. Like people inevitably, you know, have a will to live. But there's some situations where you can't fight it, can you? You cannot fight right now that disease, and and. Um, you know, I've seen it with you know Steve Prescott, who's who's a mate of mine, and say so Steve's fighting it, and 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 as much as you know, you want to believe he's fighting it. <laughs> he, he he wasn't. Do you know what I mean? And 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 it's it's just, I just, just it's an interesting thing. It as best the way you can. Yeah, exactly. And 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 we've got to be, you know, careful. I think how we position it that people are fighting this is it's a really tragic disease. That's if I look at Rob in isolation has taken away his ability to articulate himself. Can you imagine anything worse than that? What are we other than what we think and say and feel? And and not just that, think something and be able to say it how you want to say it in a way that gets across who you are. And to lose that, for me, is the saddest thing with Rob. You know, to look at that as an outsider who knew what Rob, as you know, but not not as well as you guys. It's, I, it's I think there's a beautiful narrative to Rob's story though as well, and I think I get it what you're saying about the fighting. But he he is in a position as someone with profile yeah. and someone who's been an elite sportsman, an elite athlete, and won this thing so many times. Um, he can inspire people yeah, because sure, we, yeah. we don't remember yeah, yeah, yeah. in these times, do we? The Brian who's got. MND, who lives yeah, in a one-bedroom yeah. council flat with no friends and no family yeah. and, and no one's interested in no one's... You know, what's he fighting for? And that was Fuck his motivation. Up. That was his yeah. motivation, a lot of it, with Rob and Kev, because it is about the postman, the electrician, the Britley and those people that might not have that type of profile. Um, but the, listen, I think in this world, there's a lot of technology going around as well. You know, seeing Stephen Hawking, not exactly the same thing, but are we continue? Rob loves his, his new machine, though, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, well, that, that's exit. So voice banking and a lot yeah. of this technology comes from um, aviation industry or car car technology mm. rather than the medical industry. And Elon Musk was talking a lot about these these sort of neural link devices that can help people who maybe are tetraplegic or, or have spinal cord problems. Where they almost insert what's equivalent of an Apple Watch flush, flush with your brain and, and bypass some of the signals. So what the the argument is, if I get a text message now to reply to it, that it's the thumb, the speed of the thumb that is the barrier. But if I can sort of you've seen dictation on your on your on your phones now, how quick that is at the point where you can start to think it and that links up with a voice bank all of a sudden it can reply instantly like it was Jesus before. Jonesy that's dangerous that, that's deep <laughs> and dangerous isn't it? can you imagine if your thoughts and got yeah. text absolutely <laughs> immediately yeah. Yeah. You, you, no, but you soon as, you, as soon as you thought it it got text out yeah. Yeah. I'd be I'd be divorced we'd all be finished if, we'd all if, be if my we'd... initial thoughts went out via text can you cancel it Jonesy no can you cancel the text do you know when it's the circle and it's going and it's sending and you're trying to stop it sending can you do mentally can you do that these are the questions you have to Elon ask, Musk, uh, he needs to Elon answer Musk, have to ask him, yeah. <laughs> but just on that note final note with Rob um because you because I know you reasonably well and I know you you are a people's person as you say and you're an emotional guy you wear your heart in your sleeve all those cliches but you are that's what you are not you're not a cliche um <laughs> What, what, am saying, saying? what are you what saying? Am I, am I, where are these words coming from? <laughs> well, you had a big night last night, <laughs> I did have a big night. I had one hour of sleep, everyone, by the way, if you oh, want to. You're, you're the best. Uh, I'll tell you about it later. Um, I, I, from my personal experience, so for example, my cousin has uh, MS, and it's very similar to MND in terms of its primary progressive. It's, you know, it's deteriorating. It's, again, heartbreaking. And I find it, I'm not a very, an emotional, very emotional person, but I find it hard literally sometimes just not to cry in his face, which is the worst thing you could do. The worst thing, but you must struggle when you when you when you see him. And there are times. I mean, it's taking old big hard Kevin Sinfield down, you know, and and he, he's the last person who's going to cry in front of someone's face. Yeah, 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 and yeah, you do get emotional about about it. I think it's probably more when I'm when I'm leaving or going. Um, but you know, those those memories what we've been through. Uh, when I retired, I retired with a great debt of gratitude for experiences that I've had. But what I come to realise is, you know, even though you've got these grand final rings or medals, it, it's not about that. It's about the people that you did that with, and nobody can ever take that away from us. You know, 
you're talking about inevitability. We're all going to die. We are all going to die. You know, some of us sooner rather than later. That that isn't inevitability. It's a fact. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, we don't know when that time is. We're just battling with time, aren't we? And that time, obviously, for some people, accelerates quicker than it should in, in, in debilitating ways, and, it, and it's horrendous. But when you look back, actually, on the time that we've had, we've, we've, we've nailed it, absolutely nailed it. You know, the, the reason why some of us uh, are here to exist. And Rob, for me, has absolutely nailed it. He smashed it. So, you know, whatever, whatever you believe, I've got my own beliefs as a Christian, but whatever you believe when you sat on them pearly gates and look back at that time that defines you, then he's, he's 10 out of 10, he's already smashed it, you know, so, um, so yeah, I, I, I take a little bit of solace in that, and the fight, the fight, we just, we'll, we'll keep persevering, we're trying to, 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 to make, make it right, you know, however, where we can. Yeah, look, when I open up quickly to you guys, because I really, really are grateful for you coming down Tuesday night, middle of nowhere, we're, we're actually, we're in the shadows of Old Trafford, aren't we? Seven Brothers, and shout out to Seven Brothers for having us as well. So late on on a Tuesday night, thank you very much. Um, any questions for JJB, this man, the pantomime villain of Super League, or Mr Mark Flanagan? Don't be shy, everyone. Pop your hands up. Are you happy with that pantomime villain tag? Or is it just something <laughs> we'll... <laughs> he is the pantomime villain of Not Super League, really. isn't he? Is it yeah, Come on, there's got to be a question. I can see you can... Go on, go for it. Shout it out. What was your favourite grand final? I'm just going to do it for the microphone. Favourite grand final, Favourite grand final. Oh, so they've all got stories behind them. Obviously, 2004 was my first, so that there's something that I was well below par in that. I, I was I was kidding myself. Probably my favourite one, uh, and apologies, was well, t ah, I don't know. 2009 was three in a row, and I'll tell you a story. When we were warming up, you never know if you're going to win, and to get to three in a row, you've got to win two more again, which ain't going to happen. So I remember thinking to myself at warm up, I want to get everybody to write like a mosaic of their experiences and memories of the last 24 hours. So at home, I've still got it and I haven't done it with it yet, but I will do in time. I think it'll get more prestigious. Everybody, apart from Brent Webb, everybody within the squad, the doctors, the physios, got everybody's sort of records and memories of that, that last 24 hours. And that was special, getting that three in a row. 2011 and 12, we did it two years from fifth. Everybody hated Leeds. And like, you didn't know whether to stick one finger up or two, you know, it <laughs> killed everybody. Ah, oh, no, Leeds again. And then 2017, you know, Kev had gone, uh, JP had gone, Kylie had gone. And, you know, as far as everybody was concerned, that, that was it. Leeds were gone. And we got Paggard 66-10 at Cass and we finished. But we, we turned it round and, uh, and won it. So it's almost like a good way to finish that. So my favourite game, someone was on about this the other day, was actually probably beating Melbourne Storm in 08 at Ellen Road. Um, with, with um, Inglis and Billy Slater, Cameron Smith, and that was awesome. So I'm, I'm a big Leeds fan, Leeds United, everything, all Leeds that way, marched on together a lot. Uh, and I always had this reoccurring dream of being first ever Leeds rugby and Leeds football player, that was never going to happen. <laughs> but playing at Ellen Road for Leeds Rhinos <laughs> against Melbourne and becoming a World Club champion, that, that was that was gold against a, a class team. Yeah. They ended up getting that. all the medals taken off them, didn't they, as well? That, that sort of area. Yeah, it's all recap. Yeah, it's all recap. Yeah, because we were that good. Cheating, yeah. yeah. You're like Leeds United beating Real Madrid, mate. You're like, come on. <laughs> Get that down here. <laughs> Love it. Come on, any more questions from you lot? Any more, any more, any more? Last chance. If not, we'll take a little five minute break, but we'll give a, a warm, warm round of applause for Mr. JJB. Thank you so much for coming down, Josie. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. I'm honoured.